Con Ed session, we're going to be going over our, some of our confined space equipment. Uh, we're going to start off with our tripod. As we did with the walk around, it's stored in the back of the truck where the ladders are at. This is uh, the tripod, it's taken out of its bag and in its initial uh, deployment. And typically is where we're going to deploy it at to this, to this height here so we can do our hookups. The basic hookup for our confined space system is we have a confined space pre-rig bag that has 400 feet of rope in it. It has a 200 foot main line, which is the red line we keep also in the green bag that's also stored in the red bag. And a 200 foot orange line is stored in the bag as well. So it gives us a main and a safety line. To deploy these, we simply reach into their respective bags. The main line stays pre-connected into this four to one block and tackle system. We simply hook into the tripod. There's our main line. Then our safety line. We have pre-rigged with two change of direction pulleys, which are labeled safety change of direction. We hook this to the tripod as well into its separate eyelet here. This gives us our change of direction going down into the space. Down low, we have another pulley with some, some Prusix and some webbing slings. That, that system is going to be used as our base anchor or safety anchor down low. Whether we use a system at the space, the tripod itself, if we can anchor it down. But with this system here, we are set up to start hooking rescuers onto the system. Very simple, very quick. At this point here, we would actually uh, get three people and raise this tripod up. It's simply done by pulling out these cotter pins, pulling out the pins here and raising the, the leg up. There's different increments. There's a black line at the last hole. So if you're gonna raise this thing all the way up, you simply take the tripod all the way up to the black line. With it fully deployed, it's 10 feet tall. Some of our um, limitations we have, maximum elevation is 10 feet. Our maximum drop with our four to one pre-rig, we have it labeled as 35 feet. However, doing hands-on training and some drills, we know this system here will reach our deepest uh, dry well system, confined space in the city, and it's about 42 feet deep. So this is our basic setup uh, for our tripod. Keep in mind, when you get this thing set up and you get it stood up, all the loads and everything else need to stay within the footprint of this tripod. If you start getting out of the footprint, start pulling things outside the footprint, it can cause this tripod to turn over. As far as securing the tripod, we do have options. If we are on soft ground, we do have options of driving pickets into the feet area to secure them down, or we've also lashed them to uh, different areas of some of our confined spaces. So very simple, very easy setup. Uh, for our confined space entry. Uh, along with the system you see here, we also have a, a rope line that is tied into the bottom pulley here. It's an old lifeline. Its sole purpose is, for one, it lets us know where this load is going to. It gives us a, a haul line for this system here. So when we're loading, unloading um, our rescuers and our victims. So a lot of times this will be just attached to this carabiner here, drop down to the space um, as, a, as a guideline or a tagline for lack of better terms. Moving on, we have our air systems. We have four um, air reels. As we were discussing in our previous, uh, in another session with our air, our air cart, this system here plugs into the air cart system on the respirator side, simply plugs in and you can regulate the pressure and it's labeled on the technical rescue air cart. We want to regulate the pressure going to this line around 80 or 90 PSI. But by plugging this in here, it feeds, it charges our, our, our reel here, our high pressure breathing line for our rescuers. The lines leave here and goes to our rescuer. Here our rescuer is wearing our escape bottle and it's a 10 minute escape bottle. This bottle stays off. Okay, this is solely meant for escape. If something happens to the air system, the rescuer can turn this bottle on and it will charge from this system here versus the airline. The airline itself hooks into the waist here. So the airline comes in, hooks into the waist. This is, provides him air. One unique difference with our escape bottles. 
In firefighter classes, we stress the fact that our regulator comes off of our left shoulder. That's for our life. This is a little different. The regulator comes over the right shoulder, okay? However, what is on our left hip? The escape bottle, okay? So if that's one thing you can keep in mind is how to put this thing on. The simplest thing to do is put this bottle on the left hip, okay? And then throw this regulator. This regulator piece here comes over the back over the right shoulder, clips back into the waistband, and then just your standard buckle here clips into the waist. Again, can't emphasize enough, right shoulder here, this bottle's on the left side. One thing you don't see this rescuer wearing is his harness. Normally, he would have the harness on first, and then this would go on over his harness as well as his helmet, um, gloves, knee pads, elbow pads, etc. So that's our air system. Along with our air system, we also have a communication system. A hardline communication system is required uh, for our confined space provider for the state. What this allows us to do is communicate underground in confined spaces where our radios won't reach. The issue we have with this system, as with the airline system, is when we carry this system in with us, we are carrying an entanglement hazard, so just be cognitive of that, that concept. But how this system works is we have an operator control box here. It has an attendant headset. The attendant can talk hands-free to the rescuers. We have the team box. We have one of our four communications lines comes out and terminates to the throat mic and earpiece. This is what the rescuer will wear around their neck with this being the microphone here, this simply goes around their neck, hooks in, and this earpiece is simply put on their ear. Uh, either you can strap it over their ear on their helmet strap if they're wearing an SCBA mask. This just goes on their ear and straps with uh, the Velcro here. The rescuer has hands-free communication. They don't have to push anything to talk. The attendant can mute their system <coughs> with, with they, they can mute what they're talking to with the um, inline system here. They can have a, put this in line, they can mute their conversations. They can talk freely on top of the, you know, outside of the space, but they cannot mute the rescuers. It's always a live feed from the rescuers. So this, again, terminates to the rescuer itself. One thing to also keep in mind when we're using this, these, these uh, connections here, or relief connection, so we'd actually clip this into the rescuer's harness somewhere so we're not tugging on the connector points. When you're making connection with this communication system, it's a, a lineup. You got the orange on orange. You simply line the oranges up, you press in and twist. Sometimes over time, uh, if they don't connect real good, you may have to uh, wet the gaskets in here. The easiest thing to do with that is, you know, um, wet, you can wet your finger, put in there and just kind of lube up the, the gasket there so it makes it an easier connection. The other feature we have with the communications box, with the communication system is the talk box. This goes on a separate line off the operator control. It's simply labeled talk box. This can be lowered down using a, a, a cable. When this is lowered down into the space, uh, the, the patient or victim can talk to us hands-free, and the attendant can talk to, to the patient hands-free. Uh, one thing to keep in mind, too, is when using this box to also use the relief um, strap or connector on the lines so we're not hanging this box off the connector point. Looking in the box itself, we have obviously other spare uh, throat mics, communication systems, the screwdriver and extra batteries. One thing that we, we do, these obviously take batteries to power up. We do not keep the batteries stored in them. And we've actually labeled the talk box itself, place batteries in unit before use. You simply unscrew these four screws here, take this off, you put in three C-cell batteries, as well as with the operator box, same concept as well. You know, it has 
you know, your three C cell batteries do not change in a hazardous atmosphere. And as a reminder here, place batteries in unit before use. The concept behind that, it does take a few minutes to do that, but as a confined space provider, we have to have this equipment. We don't necessarily have to use it on every single confined space, but we have to have it as a provider. And you know, yeah, it does take a few minutes to, to set this up, but while this is being set up, while the tripod is being set up, while the air system is being set up, there are a lot of things being done with completing the permit, um, getting everybody ready, so forth, so on. <clears throat> The question has been brought up with our airlines and our communication lines, why don't we put them together? We've tried that in the past. The issue we've had is sometimes we need the airlines and not the comm line, or vice versa, the comm line, and we don't need the airline. And when you don't need one or the other, it becomes cumbersome. So a common practice for us when we're deploying the rescuers into the space, if we're having a hard time managing those lines on the spare eyelet on the tripod, we can put a large knot passing pulley on there and run those lines through those pulleys to better manage it. The last piece of our confined space equipment is our ventilation fan. And this is actually kept in two sections. And as with all the other confined space equipment we saw during the walkthrough, it's, it's kept in the same compartment up top. But this system here actually disconnects the fan, the blower, and you have the tube section. It's just powered up by a simple uh, 120 plug off, off the rescue truck or a portable generator. And the unique thing with this is the duct tube, you simply unclip and we have a 20 foot tube that is deployed out and we can drop it down into the space. Obviously with bends and twists and, and things as such, we want to minimize that as much as we can. But at that point, after we get our atmospheric monitoring done, then we will do some forced air ventilation. We also have another fan identical to this on our trench collapse trailer. So in the event you need two systems of, of forced air, we can also request that, that response as well. Another concept we have is we stress um, prior to the arrival of this, say prior to the arrival of Rescue One, let's say Squad Two arrives prior to Rescue One, they have an electric fan that they can use to ventilate the space. Uh, however, stress the fact that it needs to be electric and not a, a gas powered positive pressure fan for obvious reasons. That concludes our basic confined space uh, equipment setup. Again, as with all the other technical rescue equipment, this is just an overview. So definitely come out, put your hands on, use this tutorial, put your hands on this stuff, familiarize yourself with it. And uh, if you have any questions, let us know.